let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we love you, and we do just, we are in awe as we heard this message uh, this morning about your greatness and your glory. We're reminded what a humble privilege it is to be able to enter into your presence. As soon as we say, dear God, your ear is inclined to the voice of your child. And that is such a gift. And we thank you, Father. We thank you that uh, not only do you allow us to spend time with you, but you allow us to spend time with one another. And there's no better place to be than in your word. Thank you for providing this technology that allows us to join from other areas, all parts of the world. We have uh, people from other countries, other continents here today, and I'm thankful for that, Father, and I'm thankful that we get to come together and uh, just focus on what unifies us all, and that is uh, your glory and, and faith in your Son. And so I pray, Father, that you'll help us to make the best use of our time here, uh, that we will study your Word, and that you, Father, as only you can, will uh, speak through your word to each one, meeting them at their place of greatest need, whether it's to clarify truth or to convict or to encourage, um, to give us a game plan for this week. Father, we pray that your spirit will move and delight to manifest uh, powerfully in each one of our hearts and that the result will be transformed lives. Uh, so we just commit this time to you, and we also pray for Diane and for her prayer request as she has prayed uh, for the hearts of her husband and children. Father, we ask that you will intervene in their lives and that you will hear the prayer of this mother and of this wife uh, and her concern for her loved ones, and that, Father, they will move into a deeper relationship with you and that they will come to know just how much you love them and may that be life transforming for them father we do pray for her parents uh, for their 55 year anniversary father glory to you for uh, giving diane parents um, who have enjoyed this long of a marriage and we pray father uh, as they have been a godly example uh, that they will be encouraged through the fruit of their labor during this time of celebration. And Father, that uh, you will bless this time and that uh, there will be a, a spirit of rejoicing for this marriage. Father, we love you. We know that there's other concerns here that haven't been mentioned. We pray that you'll meet each one uh, at their greatest point of need and that you'll use even the most difficult of circumstances um, to just lift our gaze up to you and to remember that you are simply, uh, you are always right there. And to speak with you, you're, you're never far away. We just have to say, dear God, and we know that you will hear us. And so uh, we give you thanks. And we pray now, Father, that we'll be able to hear you through your word as we study First Peter. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to re-mute Patsy here, but you guys feel free to unmute yourselves, join in. Hi, Patricia, I'm so glad you're here. Um, and But, you know, we have a smaller group here, so Revelation said we have a larger crowd, and so it's hard to unmute. But here, to unmute yourselves and join in the conversation, just click on your little microphone and speak up because we can hear you just as clearly as if you're sitting in the room. Um, but be opening up your Bibles to First Peter, and we're going to go ahead and... Uh, cover a few announcements again if you have any prayer requests just drop those into the chat and we will pass uh, those out to the group Laura usually posts those she's really quick about posting those on the Facebook page and uh, we'll be happy to pray for you during the week again if you want to join this life group you can come join us in the room a203 the Rockwall campus if you want to join online uh, that's perfectly fine. There's a long address there. If you can copy that down, that'd be great. We're going to try to get a URL for that shortly, but it's not there yet. So, uh, but if you click that link or copy it and go to put it in your URL, it'll take you to the registration form. And then also the revelation study is going on and we are in, this will be our fifth week out of an 18 week study. So we're still at the beginning. And we are going to begin with the judgments um, this week. We're going to be looking at Revelation 6, 
which is the breaking of six of the seven seals. So judgment is going to begin to rumble. Um, but uh, this will be a great time to start. So I hope if you haven't registered that you will do so because we'd love for you to join us. You can join the same way you just joined this group, uh, the same link. However, you whatever it took for you to get here, do the same thing, 715 on Thursday evening, and boom, you're going to be in the same place, and we'll be doing the study of Revelation. Uh, you can also register at lpstudies.com. And here is the schedule that we're following for First Peter. And First Peter is a great companion. Did I already say that? I say it a lot because it's true. Okay, it is. They're both at the end of the Bible. Um, and so they're pointing us to the end of the age. Peter is more pr trying to prepare our hearts for the end of the age and to give us a mindset because at that time that he was writing, at the time that Revelation was written, they were suffering greatly. They were facing great persecution. And so he's wanting to encourage them to live with an eternal perspective. Think about what's ahead. Jesus could appear at any moment. And so Peter's really trying to help us to prepare uh, spiritually for that. And since we had a party last week, we're going to go back and pick up uh, Hope for the Journey in verses 17 to 21 and also Loving Forever in verses 22 to 25 following the schedule. And uh, if you haven't found it yet, uh, 1 Peter is the 21st book in the New Testament, and it is also one of 21 letters that we have in our canon of Scripture that were literal letters being written to specific people. We believe that the Apostle Peter probably wrote this around AD 64, and to give his people that uh, he was writing to a right response to suffering. Can we learn from that today? Is anybody suffering? Um, so it's a, a great thing that will help us all. And, oh, Patricia, we will pray for Andrea. And I have been praying for her, by the way. And I'm glad to know it's on Friday because I prayed for her this morning. And I was wondering about when her surgery was. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And she is 50. This is her second fusion in about a year. Delicate surgery. Thank you for sharing, Patricia, because she was on my mind this morning during my prayer time, and now I know why. It'll be this Friday, so we'll be praying. Um, and then uh, who this book was written to. This book was most likely written to the diaspora in the Asia Minor. What is the diaspora? It is in the first century, there were Jewish Christians who had scattered that were ostracized from their homeland in uh, the nation of Israel, and even most likely Jerusalem, and so they were scattered at this time. Peter was an apostle to the Jews, to the Jewish Christians. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, Paul explains that in Galatians. So we know Peter was reaching out to the Jewish Christians. Paul was written, usually read, reaching out to Gentiles, although both of them ministered to both. Uh, but that was their call. So this book was most likely reaching out to the diaspora, which it also uh, makes reference to in the first couple of verses, uh, where it says to those who reside as aliens scattered. Anytime you hear scattered, it's usually speaking of those Jewish Christians. So that gives you a little bit of background. Here's our outline for First Peter. It has three simple sections. We're looking at sanctification, then submission, and suffering. My husband's really looking forward to the second se section of this book. I asked him if he wanted to teach it, uh, and he said, no, he's been trying for 30 years, and so he wants to hear me teach about it now. So we'll be uh, moving into that shortly. Uh, but here we are, a key verse in this book. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. Key verse um, in this book. Here's our outline for what we'll cover today. First, redeemed by blood, verses 17 to 21, and then in response to the gift of redemption, how should we live that out? Application is really easy this week because he gives it to us. We are to love fervently. And so let's begin. And the, what we're going to kind of take away from this is to respond to redemption by Christ's precious blood with fervent love for one another. 
So we'll begin in uh, verses 17 to 19, where he says, If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And so when we look at this, it said starts out, um, it's, this is a conditional uh, phrase that we begin with. It says, if you address as father, who is he saying? Who is he identifying? If you address as father, who? The one who impartially judges according to each one's work. And so the question is, first, who do you address as father? The Father, God. And we kind of studied that in our, our book of Revelation um, this week. And I know most of you are in that study with us. So we know that we kind of got to go into the throne room of God and we got to meet him. And when we pray, we are praying to uh, God the Father. And he is the one, it says here, who impartially judges according to each one's work. So just if you are in Christ, then you are reconciled to God in peace and love. That's done. There's no trying to earn our way into God's presence. Once you are in Christ, you have an open door into the throne room of God. And all you have to do is say, dear God, and we're there. So it's good to have that. I love the message today because that awareness that when we pray that, is it Coram Deo? Is that what he used? Coram Deo? In the presence of God. And it is the Father, and it tells us here that he impartially judges according to each person's work. And that term that is uh, glossed in our English text, impartially, only occurs one time in the whole New Testament. Anytime you see a word that only uh, appears once, it draws our attention. And it means without regard to rank or status. And so God judges each person's work without regard to rank or to status. Shoddy work is judged as shoddy work, no matter who you are. Um, God knows our motives. He knows the motives for why we do what we do. And he is measuring and judging the inward person and our work impartially. So this means if you're at the top of the totem pole or the bottom man on the totem pole, he doesn't pay attention to that. Uh, you could be the president of the United States or you can be, um, you know, whatever the opposite of that would be in this, as far as station. He doesn't look at that. Is that the same as no respecter of persons? Yeah, no respecter of persons would be another way to say that. I think it does say that in a different, um, in, in a different uh, verse. Uh, so it's good to remember that there's no trying to uh, fool God. Uh, we can try to fool each other. We can put on airs or, you know, or we can be overly humble and, and just sit at the lowest seat. Uh, God knows why we're doing what we do. And so you can't hide from him. It's just best to open your heart up before him. It's really good idea to open your heart in front of everybody else too, because if you live out, if you try to live two different lives, if you have a different inward life, then you do an outward expression of that, then it's, you know, God knows. And it's a good habit to whatever's going on the inside, let it be known uh, because God knows. And we don't want to hide that from him or from each other. Uh, he knows what we're doing. And so uh, if you address as father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, why should you conduct yourself in fear? What does it say in verse 18? It says, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing what? It says, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers. Um, so he's, he's saying uh, we should live out 
our lives kind of reverently knowing that there's nothing we can do to bring about our redemption. It's an act of God. Hasn't been done with silver or gold. You can't buy it. You're not too poor to afford it. And if you had the money, you couldn't afford it. I mean, it's not something that can be bought with silver and gold. If you're rich or you're poor, does not matter. It is by the blood of Jesus. Now, that will give some people great assurance because you're confident of your relationship with Jesus with others. Uh, they're depending on those works, and uh, we can't do that. And so there's a reason to have reverence. God is the one who knows. Uh, there is a slight uh, side note, and for some of you, you'll enjoy this. James, I think you'll get a kick out of this. Okay, so those who say that this book is written to Gentiles rather than to Jewish Christians, which is, if you, you know, depending on what level you want to study this book, that's a big discussion in some circles. Um, and so one of the reasons that they would say that this book was written to Gentile Christians is because um, those, uh, because they say that Peter would never, they use verse 18 and they say that Peter would have never called Israel's forefathers ways futile they that he doesn't think that Peter would have disrespected the ways of the forefathers but I beg to differ because uh, that's exactly what Peter preached to the Jews at Pentecost he basically said to them God sent a Messiah to save you okay epic 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 mistake you crucified him and so there's a point where you have to take ownership. And so uh, Peter preached that at Pentecost. And then Stephen, who, before he was martyred in his uh, last sermon, which is the longest recorded sermon in Scripture, is in Acts 7, uh, he himself said to the Jewish audience, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. And so obviously they do um, rebuke the forefathers and any kind of empty traditions that are passed down, anything that we're trusting in for redemption apart from the blood of Jesus would bring about God's judgment. It would capture God's attention and say, okay, we need to look at this. Um, so I do believe, I don't believe that that is a reason to believe that Peter didn't write this to uh, the Jewish Christians that he ministered to. Um, but let's think now that we've got to cross the bridge from what he originally was speaking to a Jewish audience. Now let's cross that bridge to today. And we're a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, and we have something to learn from this message. And that is, what are the silver and gold ways that Christians today might assume or mistakenly believe could be enough to bring about their redemption. What do we see today? What are people trusting in apart from the blood of Jesus? I want to go back here. Let me see. I've got a, a comment here in the chat. Y'all are welcome. If I miss it. Um, okay. Let's see. I heard a story about a man who really wanted and needed to talk to the president. He could not get past the security guards and secret service. But then a little boy came up to him and asked him what he wanted, and he took his hand and led him in right past all of the guards and security right up to the Oval Office and walked up to the president and said, Dad, this man wants to tell you something, and we do have that privilege because we know the Son, Jesus, and that is a beautiful picture. It sure is. So what are some things that people might trust in apart from Jesus to gain that type of access into God's presence? I'd say like the faith in the, uh, or more relying on your parents' faith. Okay. So we kind of talked about that last week where you might be tempted if you were born into a Christian family. You know, there are people who say, I've always been a Christian. My parents were Christian. My whole family's always been Christian. So I guess I'm a Christian. Uh, but who can't explain their relationship to Jesus. I got to work in the Connection Center here at Lake Point for like over 15 years and just hearing people's story. And people, some people would come in and they just say, I've always been a Christian. My grandmother's a Christian. My mother's a Christian. My dad's a Christian. But they couldn't explain their relationship to Jesus. Um, so it's not enough, like Laura said, just to be born into a Christian family. Yeah, or even to go to a Christian church. Going to church isn't going to be enough for redemption. 
What are some other things? I see that it says, I think they trust their good works. They also do not believe that a loving God would sentence people to hell. So they feel if they do not murder or steal things, that they're probably safe. And so trusting in your good works, if I just do enough good works that outweigh the bad things I do, maybe that will be enough for me to make it. And that's not, that's the silver and gold or the straw that will burn up on the day of judgment. Okay. Rituals. Yeah. Yeah, some churches depend on rituals saying this, you know, to be honest, a false religion would be anything that where salvation equals Jesus or the gospel plus anything else. Yeah, faith in Jesus plus anything else. It would be a false religion because salvation equals faith in Jesus, period. It's salvation is by God's grace through faith in Jesus, and there's no rituals that have to be done. Um, and so that's, that's another one of those gold and silver um, or straw. It's another way scripture describes it. Anybody else? Yes. Yes. It doesn't, in God's eyes, um, some of the, some of the temporally poorest people on earth will be the richest in the kingdom of God. And let me ask you, would you rather spend 70 years in comfort or eternity in, you know, with, with the riches of royalty. I think I would choose eternity. Uh, so our wealth here means nothing in God's kingdom. And now some, he is the source of that wealth. Some people, but you're responsible for whatever station God places you in here to be a faithful steward. But you just can't rely on that for your right. Yeah. And it's harder for wealthy people to recognize their need yeah. for a savior. So it actually gets trickier uh, for wealthier people. Uh, James says, comparing oneself with the others, looking down upon them. Yeah, comparison is a, that is a, an awful trap where we're just constantly comparing ourselves. And you can always find someone that you think you measure up better towards or someone who intimidates you. That's all a waste of time um, because who you are in comparison to others has nothing to do with your redemption or your identity in Christ. Yeah. Great comment. Um, Raphael says, trust in technology. Yeah, we have a lot of people who, uh, I think, you know, Raphael, that's a good point because I think that what's interesting in this age, okay, so we're the internet campus. We love technology because we see how God is using it. Raphael, you're from Ghana. James, you're in Kenya, and we're sitting here in Texas in the United States, and only God could bring about the technology that allows us to worship together. And I love that. Um, it just, I'm just so thankful. You have no idea. And so, but at the same time, technology can also work against the Holy Spirit and his work. Um, I think about how near the Holy Spirit is. And when I have a, a question, a doctrinal question, you know, I'll start thinking about it. Well, then the Holy Spirit starts speaking to me through his word and, and then I, I compare what I've learned in the past from, you know, orthodox teaching of Christian truths. And then I compare it with God's word and then the Holy Spirit works. But I think sometimes we do, we just Google. Let's just Google this and see what Google says. And when you Google, I got news for you. You have no idea what views are being projected onto you in that moment. Because just because a person says they're Christian, does that mean they all believe the same thing? In your, in your countries, in your, I, don't, I know here in the U.S., there's a plethora of different views uh, and within even all the different denominations. Do you guys find that true too, James and Raphael? Yeah. So uh, Google can be a great help sometimes when we have questions, but we have to be really careful with it as well. It's very subtle sometimes when we get off. All right. With all that said, those are some of the silver and gold things that we need to be aware of. Um, but redemption, it does say here in verse 19, we've been redeemed by the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And redemption is a major theme in the Old Testament. Um, the Hebrew word for redemption is, uh, goel. Uh, the New Testament word is lutrao. And it means to free by paying a ransom, redeem, liberate from an oppressive situation. 
uh, to rescue. And this word, lutrao, is borrowed from the commercial world of that first century where slaves were bought and sold. And so Peter was drawing on imagery that they were familiar with. And then this term is, is used in the Bible to describe how Jesus has purchased us from the marketplace of sin in order to set us free from sin's dreadful bondage. So the term redemption is actually a market term, and it means we've been bought back. And I think that's what Peter has in mind here when he says, you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold, dot, 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 but as a, a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Sinners are born into sin as a result of humanity's rebellion against God. So we can, we can just blame it on, um, oh, and James says it's a common thing that cuts across Africa. Um, Benjamin. Raphael says in God they trust their past Ooh, that's a big, yeah, that's something we have to be careful of too. Um, is when we, when we idolize our pastors and bishops now, I think that, um, oh, I like that. So you called Benjamin, you called Raphael Benjamin, James? Yeah. Well, okay, that's a compliment, Raphael, because Benjamin's one of my favorite. He's one of the brothers in uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. I love Benjamin. He's the youngest child, and the youngest child, you know, is always, got, is always the favorite in the family. So um, anyway, so, the, uh, so trusting in people, too, can... Um, I, you know, that goes for everybody. So uh, if you're in a Christian environment, you do want to kind of make it easy on those who are teaching the word because it's not easy. Uh, if you think if you think you have a target on your back or if you want a target on your back, uh, just sign up to teach something and you'll find out what that life is like. So make it easy on your teachers, <laughs> um, but don't idolize them. Uh, don't idolize them. Uh, they don't want to be idolized if they're really teaching under God's authority, but they also need your support and your prayers. Um, so don't just because they're in a teaching position say, oh, we're going to put him in his place or her. In her place. We, we encounter that a lot, so it's not worth it. Um, but those are all things to be aware of. Now, when it comes to Jesus, he's the one who's liberated us from that bondage to sin that we were born into. We were born into Satan's kingdom. And then God plucks us from that kingdom and he places us in the kingdom of Christ when we're redeemed by the blood. And it's that, uh, that is appropriated through faith in him. And so uh, in verses 20 and 21, it says, For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. That's so interesting to me in verse 20 where it says he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. What is Peter telling us there? You know, that Jesus was foreknown. He is eternal. He is divine. There's never been a time where Jesus has not existed. But there was a moment in time where God the Son took on flesh and became the Son of Man. And so that is uh, what he was willing to do. And God sent him for the purpose of redeeming us, because we had been rebellious, we were broken, we, we had no fellowship with God, because God cannot uh, condone sin. And so Jesus came, but Jesus was not plan B. His death in the first century was not an epic failure that we can point fingers to to those people in the first century. It was God's way of salvation that was determined at the beginning. This is at the foundation of the world. God's a omniscient, so he knew. He knew what his children would do. Um, and then in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled against God. But before God cast them from his presence, before he cast them um, from the garden, he gave them a promise in Genesis 3.15. It's the first promise of the Messiah in Scripture. It's called the mother of prophecies. The, um, and so it's the promise that there would be a deliverer who would come from the seed of the woman. And then throughout the Old Testament, there's a cadence um, that is, you can follow the scarlet thread through the Old Testament of this promise of this coming redeemer. He would be a savior of God's people. He would redeem them. And so that promise 
kind of built up momentum through the ages. And then Jesus appears and we find out it's him. Um, and so uh, apart from Jesus, uh, we don't have um, a relationship with God. But it says in verse 21, it says, through him are believers in God uh, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Uh, that is the purpose uh, for God to send Jesus. It says he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he's appeared in these last times. Why? For, for the sake of who? For the sake of you. And it says you through him are believers in God because through Jesus, we are now reconciled to God. And it was God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. Why did God do that? What was the purpose? Anytime in scripture you see so that, it's an indication of purpose. And that so, so he tells us here, why did God, for what purpose did God raise Jesus from the dead and give him glory? So that your faith and your hope are in who? Are in God, who raises the dead. So here we are. We can sum up these 17 to 21. Uh, we are redeemed from futility and sin by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. I actually took this picture at a museum in Galilee, and I can't remember where it was. I wish I had put the label on it, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but we are redeemed from futility and sin by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. And what do we learn about God? That God raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory so that our faith and our hope are in God. As you consider that truth, uh, think about how does the resurrection and glory of Jesus cause you to place your faith and hope in God? How does knowing, or does it, is that your understand? Does your understanding of the resurrection of glory in Jesus does it cause you to put your faith and hope in God? Because that was the purpose that was established in His resurrection. Something to kind of consider about. Y'all might want to discuss that a little more and flesh that out. Uh, let's go on and look at verses twenty-two to twenty-five um, in the second. Mark says, "Thank you, Mark." Uh, Christ was chosen as our Redeemer, John 17, uh, 24, exactly. Um, and I love that even going into this section, Mark, because think about the gift that God was not willing to remain separated from his people. In fact, he wanted that reconciliation so much that he willingly sent his beloved son to come into the world, to take on our sin. Jesus, he didn't just like pay a price for our sin. On the cross, he took on, he became the curse of sin. And the whole entire, all of the wrath of God was laid on him. God willingly crushed his son, his beloved son, for the sake of our redemption. And Jesus came willingly and offered up his body as a sacrifice for us. And so he was chosen as our redeemer. And when you think about how that gift of God, that he did not withhold his one and only son from us and crushed him in our place. Think about the magnitude of that love and grace as we go into this next section. Uh, so Mark, thank you for uh, triggering that with that comment. Um, and how are we to respond? It tells us in verses 22 to 25. It says, let's look at 22 and 23. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. How does verse 22 say that our souls have been purified? By what? By, what? by obedience to the truth. Yeah. yeah, by obedience to the truth. And what is that truth that we must be obedient to in order to have our souls purified? Let's say faith in Jesus. Faith, faith. in Jesus. Yes, faith in Jesus. Because it's... Faith in Jesus alone 
um, that will bring about our redemption. Uh, Jesus is the Son of God. He came, gave his life as a sacrifice. His blood was shed. He died. He was buried in a rich man's tomb on the third day. He was raised up by God to new life, proving that he had the final victory over sin and death. And now salvation is appropriated through faith in Jesus. And so if you believe this, and if you've received Jesus as Savior and Lord, then it's obedience to this truth of the gospel, faith in Jesus, that your souls have been purified. It's not based on any good thing that you've done, but on the powerful blood and finished work of Jesus. That is how our souls have been purified. If we think for a moment that we can add anything to the finished work of Christ, then it cheapens the infinite. I mean, I, it just cheapens what God has done, his sacrifice and the price he was willing to pay. We can't add anything to that. Not our works, not who we are, not our station. Nothing we manage can add to or take away what Jesus has fully accomplished on our behalf. Um, but for what purpose have our souls been purified? What does it say in verse 22? It says, for what? Your, it says, obedience to the truth purified your souls for what? A sincere mm -hmm. love. Yes. My brethren. A sincere love um, for a, a love, sincere love of the brethren. And then it says, fervently love one another from the heart. And to fervently love from the heart is to persevere in love. It's to love eagerly. It's to love sacrificially. It's to love continually, constantly, regardless, sacrificial love. And it, who are we to love? Who does it say in verse 22 that we are to love? Is it, are we to love the world? It says in this one, the brethren. It says the brethren. And sometimes our folk, it's easier to love the world. We feel sorry for the sinners and it's easier to love them. And then we become cannibals and eat each other up. There have been so many people that we have met at iCampus who have been wounded by the people who should be loving them. Love the brethren. Love the brethren. We are called to fervently love one another in response to that sacrificial love of God. We had rebelled against him. We had insulted God. We still insult God. And yet he did not withhold his beloved son from us. Who are we to withhold our love from one another? As we compare ourselves to each other, and then when we don't feel someone measures up, we just, we're so quick to wound. And how does God see that? When he's the one that is bringing these people um, to this safe place of fellowship. And when that becomes, you know, a, a battleground where people are wounded, that is the opposite of what God had looked for when he sent his son. And so this is something, I, this is a powerful passage for the purpose um, that we see that God had for redeeming us was to establish the kind of brotherhood where we love one another as a reflection of the vertical love of God in us. So I, I was really moved by this passage this week. And then I thought about, have you experienced that kind of fervent love from anyone? Who comes to your mind? Oh, and I hope somebody does. I hope somebody comes to, Jay says agape love. Exactly. Agape love is what the way that God loves us. The least we could do is come up with the, uh, bro the love of the brotherhood, um, which is uh, what God, God didn't even say love each other, the agape love. He loves us that way. The word that's used here is the word for brotherly love. He didn't even ask, but we should go that far with agape love. Um, but he knew, he knew we, we probably wouldn't be able to manage that. But yeah, that focuses on the brotherly um, when have you experienced that kind of love? Have you? Have you? Yeah. That's, and what does it feel like to be loved that way? Kay says she has been loved that way. Yeah. Oh, she says it was amazing and it changed her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, wow. And it really opened the door to a career discussion of faith. Yeah. Because it was so strong. Oh. The love and care that I felt was so strong. So were you the one that so, was near death? Yeah. So Kay so said she was near death, death. And, and those, those of her friends. family loved her so well through that, gathered around her, and she experienced that love that brought you to a deeper faith. And that's what God intends. That is what God intends. Now, if we've received that kind of love ever in our life, and too few have, how could you reach out and make someone else feel that love? What can we do to make other people feel the kind of love when we've experienced love at its best? And I think that's, you know, something we can draw from when we wonder, you know, how can we love? Uh, think about how you've experienced love and then go out and, and love others in that way. Uh, we have been born again. And we see this word uh, born again in verse 23, where it says, for you have been born again, uh, not of the seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. We saw this word born again, anaganao, in 1 Peter 1, 3, at the very beginning of the book, where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So God caused us to be born again. And then we see it here. These are the only two times this verb appears, in, or this word appears in Scripture, or two times in 1 Peter 1, where he says, You have been born again, not of the seed which is perishable, but imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Uh, look at the word quickly, uh, in per or perishable versus imperishable. Uh, uh, perishable, vatharthos, means subject to decay, whereas imperishable, and both these terms appear in this passage, um, aftharthos means imperishable, incorruptible, immortal. All right, so a little biology lesson. Um, first time we were conceived in our mother's womb, we had the seed of the father, met the woman's, you know, okay, what happened, and then they, the seed traveled, fertilized the egg, and conception in the womb. Okay, that seed, was it perishable or imperishable? Perishable, because they're human. They are two sinners, and we were born into sin. Uh, that was just passed down. That's something we all inherit. That's not the birth he's talking about here. This is the, um, the imperishable seed, aphartos, and that seed is when, uh, when we come to faith, that seed is the Holy Spirit of God. When our faith receives the gospel of Jesus, then a spiritual conception takes place, and we are born again. And that born again, anaganao, uh, is of an imperishable seed. There's a literal birth that takes place that we can't see. We don't always feel different when we're born again, but it's a reality that we've been now born and we're a person. Our souls will not die. And that is what to be born again means only appears. We hear we're born again believers. If you want to know where that came from, only first Peter chapter one is the only time that that is explained. Um, then verses uh, 23, it says um, for you. Uh, oh, it says for you've been born again, not of the seed which is perishable, but through the living and enduring word of God. And it is through Jesus that creation uh, came into being in the first place. Our physical birth was through Jesus because it says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Um, all things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Uh, and then we see uh, that also our spiritual rebirth comes through knowledge of him through the enduring word of God. Four, verses 24 and 5 say, quoting Isaiah 40, verse 6, All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Um, and so this is, a, that's actually Peter fulfilling prophecy and heralding this message that was prophesied that would be heralded in the 8th century B.C. by um, Isaiah. 
And so uh, he is telling us, this is the word preached to you. And what was that word preached that brings eternal life but the gospel? Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Gentile. Okay, Paul's not ashamed of what? The gospel. What is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes it? The gospel. What is the gospel? Thankfully, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. Take note of what it is. Which I preach to you, which also you receive, which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. That is the gospel really focusing on um, three and four. Uh, what is the gospel? Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised up on the third day. If you are sharing that message, then you are sharing the gospel. That is the power of God for salvation. If you're sharing just your testimony that forgets to mention the gospel, there's no power in that. Be sure you can clothe you can clothe, Paul did, clothe the gospel with your testimony, but make sure that the gospel itself, which never changes, is preached because it is that gospel when people respond um, that they are redeemed and they are saved. And so uh, here's our passage. Here's our summary of this passage, verses uh, 23 to 5. We are to love fervently from the heart because we have been born again, redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. And that's really the heart of this passage. Um, so uh, the word of the Lord endures forever. And that is in Isaiah 40, verse 6. Also, Peter's quoting that. And so those who have been born of the word of God, who Jesus, his name is, one of his names is the word of God. If you've been born of Christ, then you endure forever. Uh, and the word that, of the Lord endures forever as well. He watches over his word to perform it. How does knowing that you've received the gift of eternal life through redemption by the blood of Jesus inspire you to love fervently and to live faithfully? Maybe that's something you can talk about and get up, you know, a game plan for this week um, and just have the mindset to start out this week loving big. Raphael says, Jessica, I really need God to help me in this because the more I love my brethren, the more they keep doing the wrong things. Pray with me that my focus shouldn't be on their wrongdoing, but God's love. Amen, Raphael. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I hear you too, Raphael. And uh, Mark says, Raphael, I think we struggle with that in our Western world Christianity. I remind myself that I'm to share the word. I'm not their Holy Spirit. I try to examine my own life daily. Blessings to you. Uh, yeah, there's, we aren't each other's Holy Spirit. Uh, we're to exhort each other, but we're not ever to be cruel. And that happens way too much here in the U.S., uh, I hope it's not happening in other countries, but uh, here we are called to a different way. And let's, uh, let's close up with a word of prayer, and then y'all can discuss this. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that uh, you have reminded us that you are love and that you have saved us from what we were so that we could love you first and love each other. And, Father, we see that um, happening, um, sadly, not enough around us. And so in this fallen age, and you prof you revealed that in the end of the age, that the love of most will grow cold. And that's a scary place to be. Father, I pray that for those who have been redeemed, that you will fan the flames of love in our hearts. And that as Raphael said, even when we are hurt, that we will love the way that you loved us even when our sin hurt you and that you'll give us that strength, that you'll pour your love in us and through us so that this week we can love big, we can love sacrificially, we can love continually. Uh, Father, that the love that we uh, show to our brethren will bring glory and delight to you. And Father, may you delight to pour even more love into our lives so that we can even be a greater vessel of love towards other, all in response to our redemption that you, Father, in your grace, did not withhold your son from us. Father, thank you for sending him. Thank you for the gift of redemption, not by silver and gold, but by the precious blood of your son. May we live humbly in light of that gift and love big and graciously, no matter what, 
this week. We can only do that in your strength, and it will be to the praise of your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.